take two. Okay, welcome everybody to this talk on uh, Taffy Grams. Glad you could take the time out to uh, attend. Uh, before I launch off, let's just uh, do a bit of admin. Can you just make sure that your uh, audio is muted? Thanks. Um, Sant will be checking for questions throughout the talk and he can interrupt me anytime he wants. And he's also recording this. Hopefully he's recording it now anyway. Um, and uh, if if the recording isn't sufficient, I'm also going to post this presentation on the um, website so that you can look at the slides in your own time. Plus, there are some extensive notes under some of the slides with material I won't be addressing straight off. Um, just a bit about myself. I think most of you know me. I've got a couple of thousand hours of gliding. I've flown in many places around the world. I've made a little check up today of nine country, different countries, predominantly New Zealand. Well, UK, New Zealand, France, and Switzerland. And um, one other thing which is maybe pertinent is that I've actually got a couple of engineering degrees in chemical and um, petroleum engineering, which some of the science behind tephrograms actually overlies that. Um, so I am familiar with some of the very basic principles. However, I'm not a meteorologist. So there might be some stuff in here which is well, uh, this is a very complex science. I'm not going to go into that, of course. Um, I'm going to keep it fairly high level. Um, why am I talking to you tonight about this stuff? Well, you can blame Colin Hamilton a couple of years ago. Colin uh, generally persuaded me to do a talk on Tefri Grounds as part of a full cat course. Um, I guess it went okay because he asked me to do the same thing for a cross country course he was giving as well. Um, Okay, now tephrograms are a technical subject. Um, there's no escaping that. But what I'm going to do here, what I'm going to attempt to do is do it in two parts. The first part just today is going to be as uh, basic as, you, as I can make it and still convey the utility of tephrograms. So it's not going to be quantitative this bit, it's more qualitative. Part two, which is on Tuesday, will be a bit more quantitative with a bit more science behind the actual subject. Not a whole lot, but a little bit more. And before I forget, Alistair Much has asked me to put in an advert about tomorrow's meeting, about um, the uh, update to the uh, the update meeting. They've got a session tomorrow at 7.30. Sorry, I know I almost forgot that. So right, let's, uh, let's get on. So the talk is going to talk about what are tephrograms? What sort of stuff do they show? And how can you use them to pick a good day? As I said, it's going to work at two levels. This first bit is a qualitative level, and then we can do some more quantitative stuff later on in part two on Tuesday. I guess the first question is why do you use tephrograms at all? Um, Just to correct that, Phil. Sorry? It's, it's Monday we're doing it on. It's, Beg your pardon, is it Monday, is it? Oh. Yeah, that's it. I better get the right day then, I? Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> it's Monday, okay. Um, question, why use tephrograms at all? Well, that's a good question. Um, I use them, I know Sant uses them. I suspect others do. I think Alistair much uses them as well. Um, what I, why I use them is that they give a concise, at a glance overview of soaring potential. It's, it's speed, it's simplicity, and it, actually end up talking to Santa and others about the tephigram as much as any other component of forecasting. However, they're not a complete picture, so you never use them alone. So don't, um, don't ever think that just looking at tephigram is going to be all, all you ever need to do. But they are very useful in my mind to, um, to, you, to get a quick summary. You can use all the soaring forecasts from the likes of RASP, Sky site top meteo, and you should use them as well as these tephrograms. Um, but tephrograms actually sort of give you a bit of an insight as to what makes the forecast tick, and we'll, we'll come on to that a bit later. Um, also, there's tons of information on the, on the uh, internet about tephrograms, so you know, uh, there's, no, there's no special insights here. Uh, you can go off and find and read all the stuff you want, but hopefully, what I've done today is sort of weave sort of science, if you want to call it that, the with the actual practical application. And I'm going to pitch this one at the sort of early cross-country pilot, somebody who isn't technical, 
who doesn't really want to be asked listening about thermodynamics and don't blame them and all that sort of stuff. So. Okay, um, first up, what are they called? Uh, well, I'm calling them tephigrams. The word tephi is a, con is a sort of contraction of the T phi gram, T being temperature, phi being a quantity called entropy, which we won't address anymore, but it means energy in a way. They're sometimes called log P skew T, log P being pressure, skew T being temperature, T for temperature, or they're sometimes just called skew T, or they're indeed they're just called the sounding. Um, RASP calls it a sounding. I kind of think it's sounding more of the balloon where the equipment, you know, the instruments go up on the end of a balloon. Uh, SkySight calls it a skew T. They're all pretty much the same thing. They're not identical, but we're going to use them interchangeably. Uh, where can you find them? Well, I've already said really. You get what I've called here synthetic tephigrams from RASP. If you don't know where to find RASP, well, you go to the pilot section of the SGC website. Uh, as I said, they're called, uh, they're called um, soundings on RASP. Um, I quite like RASP because they're easy to see and use them. And the other thing about RASP is that it'll generate tephigrams for pretty much any place, in particular the BGA term points. Um, the other thing, great thing about RASP because it's free, um, whereas SkySight requires a subscription. So both, I mean, if you're not familiar with RASP and SkySight, um, they're both storing forecasting programs using very sophisticated computational techniques to generate storing forecasts. They're not just generating tephigrams. And in fact, tephigrams are just something these programs spit out just so that uh, the likes of me can pretend we know about, you know, we know all about them. So they're not actually used by the programs. They're just a, a sideline which the programs generate. Now around the world, they do take real soundings, which is where they let balloons go up into the air. And if you want to find them, there's two sites have indicated there. Um, University of Wyoming and then the French meteocenter.com. So that's where you find them. Uh, as I say, we'll be now concentrating on RASP, the, the uh, tephigrams in RASP. Okay, right. This is a, an important slide. What do they do? It's clear, you need to be clear that tephigrams do two separate things. One is quite simple, they just display air temperature and dew point data, I've used the word in inverted commas, we'll see why in a minute or two, versus height above a given location at a given time. Okay, so they, uh, they also show wind velocity with height as shown as well as a, as a convenience. The key thing about using any tephigram is that you should always check the location, date and time. You'll see many, te the, the programs like RASP and SkySight continually generating different vintages of forecast and each vintage of forecast will have a different tephigram. Um, now tephigrams are originally developed or used I think it's almost 80 or 90 years ago, actually, when the first things came out. So well before computer programs and all that good stuff. And they were used to, to understand thunderstorms, convective, convective activity. That was obviously a major feature of the weather people wanted to understand. And as a byproduct of that, it allows glider pilots to make a quick assessment of thermal activity via something I've called here calculating curves. Um, Sort of the act, what do you mean by thermal what, by activity, thermal activity? Being, are there any? What height will they rise to? Will there be clouds? Will there be blue? Um, what height will the cumulus, cumulus cloud base be? And maybe will there be any spread out present? They're quite useful for us, but again, to emphasize, they are not to be used on their own. You should use them alongside sort of general purpose forecasts pressure charts, RASP's own soaring prediction forecast, Sant mentioned them. And, and actually Sant, maybe we should just take a note. Um, have we ever actually done a talk on how 
whether you know how, how to use the weather resources for soaring for gliding and has, have we ever done a talk on that whereby yeah. somebody you know shows how you walk through a yeah I, i've got a I, I did one a, a few years ago um most of my, I've got all my uh, videos and perhaps, you know, later on what we can do is, uh, or should I say videos, all my PowerPoints um, and I can put them on. But unfortunately, I don't make a lot of notes. Um, I just, because, you know, know what I'm going to talk about. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we have covered that before walking through how to, uh, it's been from wave point of view, not from thermal. I've sure. always done it from the wave point of view. Okay. That's maybe something to um, think about. Anyway, what we're going to do now is just concentrate. Yeah, just, sorry to interrupt there. Colin's just come up with a message on that. Uh, let me just check it, saying that, you know, they cover it on the cross-country courses, um, okay. you know, amongst other subjects as well. Sorry, carry on. Yep, no, fair enough. Um, okay, so we're just going to concentrate on point one to start with, which is the, um, the basic data, which is shown on a tephigram. Um, I've used the word air temperature there, and indeed that's what tephigrams displays. Uh, you might see on some information on the uh, on the internet, they can call that things like environmental lapse rate, which is an awful term actually. Um, kind of kind of gives a suggestion that some fixed rate or some constant rate of environmental temperature change, which isn't true. Um, environmental temperature is fine, but it means the, the temperature of the general air, the, the air at a general level in the atmosphere. Okay, let's go and have a look at a tephigram. Here we go. Right. I don't know how many people have seen these before, but if this is the first time you've seen it, it just looks a bit of a mess, doesn't it? It looks uh, very busy and very complex. Um, now, it, it, it only looks like that because it's actually made up of several overlaid components. And what we're going to do here is just take the first layer of the components and look at them to start with. So we'll just look at the main structure of the tephigram and hopefully you can see the pointer here. Uh, okay, so we've got, we've got uh, the main grid is basically temperature along the x-axis here and then height going up the way here. Um, so the height goes up in thousands of feet, so that's ground level 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, it's hopefully fairly, uh, fairly obvious, so that's thousands of feet vertically. The temperature runs along the bottom axis, as I've said, it goes from minus 30, so this would be almost a ground level, minus 30 all the way up to plus 40. So we've got temperature going from left to right increasing. So far, so good. Now, here's the first bit of curly stuff I'm going to throw at you, or tephigrams throw at you. Is that instead of on a normal graph, the temperature lines, or sorry, the grid lines would go straight up. On a tephigram, they go off to the side diagonally. So you can see that the 30 degree line, hopefully you can see that on this, goes off diagonally to the upper right. The line from 20 degrees goes diagonally up the upper right as well and so on and so on so it's a bit of a strange graph in a way in that the lines the vertical lines aren't vertical they slope and you have to be careful it's easy to get caught out with that so they're sloping um, if you want to know why they're sloping I suggest you download this PowerPoint presentation because there's a section on why they're sloping uh, there is a sound reason they're just people aren't just making life awkward for you um, okay, so uh, just just to finish off on the main axes, you can see also that we've got pressure. This this axis here is pressure in hectopascals, and you can see that it's inverted, of course, and it corresponds exactly with the height axis. So you can see that nominally 1,000 hectopascals, which is close to the surface, close to zero. 850 hectopascals is nominally about 5,000 feet, hopefully you can see that that's about 5,000 feet there. 700 hectopascals, nominally 10,000 feet, and 500 hectopascals, nominally 18,000 feet. 
let's forget hectopascals from now on. We're just going to concentrate on the high peak. Um, one thing to, uh, one of the things, sorry, yeah, the wind information is shown on here. Now that this is quite useful. It doesn't take part in some of the calculations which the tepidam is designed to do. It's just there for convenience. So it's worth just looking at the plot there. So the wind information goes from, it shows speed. There's a little subscale here, 0, 20, 40, 80 knots. This is on RASP. And you can see that the little green line goes up there indicating the speed. So on this particular day, the wind speed is quite low. It's probably less than 10, uh, 10 knots until you get to about 8,000 feet, then it jumps up a little bit. So that's how you read the wind information in terms of speed. And then even more difficult to see, apologies for that. Probably a better example further on in the presentation. You see these little wind arrows. And though you consider those as arrows, they're pointing the way the wind is blowing. So this wind is from the northeast. We've got little ticks on the on the tail of the arrow. The small tick is five knots, big tick is ten knots. And you can see up here where the wind has swung around actually. You see these black triangles, that's 50 knots. Um, I think that's fairly standard wind nomenclature. So you've got the wind on there as well, which is quite uh, useful. Um, you can see that there's some other lines on this plot. I'm not going to talk about them just now. I'm going to talk about them later. Um, the other thing is that the plot also has a time and a date. It's very important to check the time and, the, and particularly the date. When you're downloading or looking at stuff from RASP, <clears throat> always, always check that. And always use the latest uh, forecast or the most the forecast with the highest resolution. No I interject there, uh, Phil. Say again? The, day, uh, the other thing that's important is, is the actual forecast time, because that can be out. That's right, 20 hours and so on. Sometimes okay, yeah. Let me just take, okay, very briefly explain what that is. When they start these computer models running, they take a long time. So they have to, and they require a lot of data, a massive amount of data, and they have to set the model up and then they say, right, Mr. For right, machine, I want you to start forecasting. I want you to generate a forecast starting at uh, you know, seven o'clock and we're going to run forwards or something like that. And so these times here show how far forwards this forecast is. So this is 20 hours ahead of where they initialize the model. So they initialize the model at seven o'clock in the evening prior to this. And the machine spatted, spat the answer out, if you call it an answer, at uh, about four o'clock in the morning. There'll be another one spat out, another tachygram spat out at 1600 hours, and that will come out a few minutes after this one, and that'll be a 21 hour forecast. So you can see them, the machine is kicking out these tachygrams on a particular run. Always make sure, if possible, you're using the most up to date run and the highest resolution run. Don't want to get too far off topic, but RASP generates forecasts at various horizontal scales or, or spatial scales, I should say, of two kilometers. That's a horizontal scale on the Earth's surface. It does much smaller scale in the Earth's atmosphere, about 100 meters or so. That's getting a bit far off there. Okay. Um, so always check that. Just, just, just so that people feel a bit more comfortable with what's been shown here. We're going to look at the this air temperature. We're going to look at the air temperature curve now. So this curve has been, in this particular case, is calculated by a computer, and it's saying that at 1500 BST at calendar on Monday the 30th of April, it expects the air temperature at the surface to be approximately 12 degrees centigrade. People agree with that? It's zero, ten. 20 so i think it's going to be it's going to be around about 12 11 or 12 oh, sorry 11 or 12 degrees it's saying that at about 4000 feet sorry 4000 feet the temperature is going to be 0 degrees so there's the 0 degree grid line going up and if you read across the temperature is going to be 
at the height is 4,000 feet. So at 4,000 feet, the temperature is zero degrees. It also rounds out the air temperature is going to continue along this red, solid red line. And about 8,000 feet, it's going to be minus 10 degrees. So the minus 10 degree grid line intersects the air temperature curve read across to get 8,000 feet. If you want to stand the question on its head, you might want to say, OK, at what height, uh, what's the temperature at 16,000 feet? Well, you just go to 16,000 feet, read straight across, boom, the red line is intersected. Oops, sorry, let me get my pointer back, intersects temperature the 20 degree temperature line so it's saying minus 20 degrees at 6,000 16,000 feet so you what you're doing you're just reading off the height and the temperature using these sloping grid lines hopefully that is fairly straightforward we'll come on to a, a further example like this is just the first cut of looking at this Dew point temperature, now is everybody clear what dew point is? Hopefully they are. This is the temperature at which water starts to condense out of the air. I don't know why they call it dew point. Yes, dew's on the ground, but it's not dew in the air. It's actually a cloud. It's actually could be called the cloud point temperature. So it's the temperature at which cloud will form. If the air falls to that, this dew point temperature cloud will form. So there's this, the computer is calculating or the balloon with its instruments are actually measuring that the dew point on the ground here at calendar at this particular time is around about minus five degrees centigrade. So let me just, let me just uh, get the arrow properly. You can see that you can read this off in a similar way that at around about 5,000 feet, the dew point temperature is about minus nine degrees centigrade. Let's go a bit crazy. Let's go to 16,000 feet. You can see that the dew point is actually very low here. Uh, and it's almost run off the scale in that we've got minus 30 grid line there, minus 40 grid line there, minus 50 grid line there, so and a minus 60 grid line there. So the, the dew point at around about 16,000 feet is about minus 55 degrees centigrade. <coughs> Right, hopefully that is fairly clear. The other thing to know about dew point, the dew point for curve is that it can never be to the right of the air temperature curve. Hopefully everybody's clear on that. You won't ever see it there. You may see the dew point curve overlying the air temperature curve. And that just means there's cloud. That's, that's what happens when cloud forms. The, dew, the air temperature is the same as the dew point temperature by definition if you have cloud. If there's a big gap between the two, we call that very dry air. If there's a narrow gap, you've got to say, hmm, tell you what, there could be a bit of cloud there. There isn't any showing there, but we'll come on to it later. That might well be at some stage of the day. Um, <clears throat> so that's showing you what the data is at the very first level. Oops, sorry. Um, just to reiterate where the data comes from, I know this is probably backtracking a bit now, but. The data comes from actual direct measurements, which are usually made, well, not usually, they are made on using a balloon carrying uh, equipment up, basically a thermometer and a dew point, um, uh, an electronic device which calculates or measures something which can be converted into dew point. Um, and that's carried up through the atmosphere. It's, uh, it's got a pressure gauge on it so they know how high it is and they track it probably these days by GPS and it's radio signal down. So they get the air temperature, the dew point temperature with height, because they have pressure measurements and GPS measurements. <coughs> and they also get the wind velocity because they know where it's drifted at what rate and which direction. So it's fairly simple to do. That's great. That sounds like it's real information. Actually, it's not very useful to mm -hmm. the glider parts because it's measured in the past. Even if you, you know, it's measured infrequently in the past, and at one or two locations. By the time you get the information, the air mass which it measured has long gone over, gone over to Norway or something like that. Okay, where we normally get them from, and obviously where you've seen them so far coming from in this talk is sky sight and rest. 
these are the computational weather forecasting models, which I said, just bang this out as a bit of a side of product in a way. The beauty of these guys, these devices, is that they can provide predicted forecasted tefigrams for any location at any time and any place within the scope of the forecast. And the scope of the forecast for RASP is RASP UK. It does a model over the entire UK. It even does a separate model over RASP Scotland. So both those two models will be generating tefigrams for any place, well, practically any place, but at practically any place and any time within the scope of the forecast. The models usually only go out for about six days. Um, yeah, if you believe the model's out of six days, I've got some interesting financial propositions for you as well. Um, <laughs> but um, they're kind of, they, um, they, so the models, I mean, I know, I know, I do actually know something about these models, so I'm not waffling, I am waffling, but hopefully not too badly. They are actually pretty good at predicting pressures, winds, and temperatures, which is pretty much what the tefigrams show. They're not so good, they're less good at predicting weather, particularly out at four, five, six days. Weather being <coughs> rain, cloud, you name it, that sort of precipitation, storms and stuff like that. Um, and I've got, an, I've got another bombshell coming on later on what these programs don't do as well. So it's going <laughs> to probably open your eyes a bit if you don't already know. Um, so these, these Sky, Sky RASP are pretty good. There's another model called Top Meteor, which is also very good, but they don't seem to put out tefigrams. They probably, probably don't think there's a market for them. Top Meteor is a commercial thing as well. Um, so anyway, I'll, uh, let's, let's move on. So that's where the data comes from. I'll just show you what real data looks like. This is a, a sounding taken a long time ago now, 15 years ago. Northern England, Albemarle is in, uh, I think, County Durham, I think. So this is a real tefigram. It's got, it doesn't show height, but it shows the pressure, shows wind directions and strengths. And it's got those two lines on it, you know, the, the air temperature line and the dew point line. You can see there, there would be a bit of cloud there because the two point and uh, air temperature line overlaps on bonfire night. Okay. Um, just interestingly, totally nothing to do with the talk. There's the uh, stratosphere, there's the stratopause, and I suppose it is relevant actually. The temperature line there, you see how the temperature is constant. It's running along one of those temperature grid lines. That shows that as you go high, the temperature is constant. It's not a very warm high temperature, it's 50 degrees, minus 50 degrees, but that's the stratosphere. That's the, that's the top of weather, basically. Uh, just to show they still do them, here's one just a couple of weeks ago. We do them every day. Um, um, you can see that the plot is a bit more like the RASP plot we're used to. It's got, now it's got height up the side here. It's got those pressures up the side, the other side. It's got the same, same scale. Um, Bit more colourful, they do a bit more analysis on it. But they only take these things to uh, once, or, once or twice a day, midnight, midday, possibly, four or five sites throughout the UK. So they don't, um, they don't do many and they're not very useful to us. So it's, um, anyway, let's move on. Right, um, we'll do some sim simple observations next. So you should be looking at several forecast tefigrams for the day. So if you didn't know anything about them or did, at the most basic level, what you can answer fairly quickly is, are there any cloud layers present? So they, are there any regions or layers where the dew point is equal to the air temperature? How close are the air temperature and dew point lines? If they get quite close, you can actually get cloud forming even if they don't overlie. Another question is, uh, where's the freezing level? Why do you want to know that? Yeah, you, you know, comfort level, if you're going way flying, might, might influence what you, how you dress. Uh, another one is showers, if there are showers, if the freezing level is quite low and you think there's going to be cloud around, there'll be showers if the, if the clouds go well into the freezing level. And another one might be cloud icing. It's um, minimal. And then, of course, <laughs> Straight away, you can see what the wind velocity on the ground and its soaring heights are. It's interesting, but it doesn't really answer the questions 
let's just take a quick look at a couple of examples. So, so again, this is what a cloud layer looks like. I've already said that. If you've got the dew point line and the air temperature line over line, you've got cloud. And RASP actually has a cloud indicator on a little subscale here. It's called a cloudiness, and I've called it a cloudiness indicator. They call it grid scale cloudiness. It grows from zero to one, where I presume one means totally cloudy or very thick cloud. And you can see that where there is an overlap between those two lines, the air temperature and the dew point curve, you've got cloud showing. The reason it's called grid scale cloudiness is that these computer models work on a, a large scale blocks or grid in the, of the atmosphere. And these grid blocks are two, four or 10 kilometers, two, four and 12 kilometers in RASP's case, they're that big. So the cloudiness it, that RASP and other programs pick up is actually has to be widespread. In other words, it's fronts, cloud around fronts, you should say, stratus clouds and potentially large cumulonimbus clouds. Okay, here's the bombshell. Um, those forecasting programs, SkySight, Top Meteo and RASP, do not explicitly forecast thermals. Um, and therefore they do not explicitly forecast cumulus. Um, the reason they don't directly or explicitly forecast thermals is that with their grid spacing of two kilometers, that's far too big to see a thermal. How big is a thermal? Okay, how big is a piece of string, but one kilometer across. Could be, could even be less. Sure, I've flown through small ones. Um, th these programs don't pick that up. They cannot explicitly forecast them. What they do, they do something where they take the, during the course of the computation, they analyze the state of the model, particularly down the low layers, and they say, given these conditions, there will be thermals. And so the model then starts to introduce the effect of thermals, such as small cumulus, such as mixing of the atmosphere, and it incorporates that into the model function running. It's called parameterization, fancy word for fudging, um, fudging a fix. Nonetheless, a very sophisticated, it is, I shouldn't say fudging, it is, it is guided, it is, it is scientifically based or empirically based in some cases. But it is a bit of a bombshell that they don't actually forecast cumulus. So, in some, so if you don't see if you don't see cloudiness indicated in some of the plots where you think they're going to be thermals, don't worry, there may well be thermals. It's just that these programs can't see them. <coughs> okay, uh, so that was a low cloud layer, freezing level. Okay, this is my player animation on PowerPoint. It's the only one I'll do this on. So freezing level, pick up the zero degree isotherm, take it up, the sloping line, sloping grid line, why does it hit the air temperature line? Oh, sorry, the, sorry, isotherm is just the fancy word for all these temperature grid lines. <laughs> Go up the, the zero degree isotherm until you hit the air temperature line. There you go, air temperature line, and uh, read it off. Freezing level just above 12,000 feet. Uh, as I say, that's only semi useful, really. Right, moving on. So, any questions so far just on that? I better get my skates on. Sounds any any queries on that? That's all pretty straightforward. Isn't it? Oh, yeah, there's no queries uh, at all. Oh. Everybody's left, have they? Okay. Well, we still got <coughs> 44 well, people. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Okay, I've got a question. At basic level, what does a good soaring day look like on a tephigram? Okay, I'll get to it as quickly as I can. Um, oh, right. Um, let me just put up a bit of a warning for those who are squeamish about plots and stuff like that. <clears throat> I'm going to go into... Oh, uh, there's a question, of... Phil. There's a okay. question, Phil. Yep. What are the lines going northwesterly from X, uh, from the X axis? Just about to address that right now. So thank you, whoever asked that question. The check's in the post. Um, right. Okay, so... We'll go into quantitative stuff 
and it's sort of more technical stuff in part two, which is on Monday. Thank you, sir. Um, but uh, to, to go much further, we just do need to look at just a couple more curves, a couple more bits, components on these uh, tephrograms. And let's do that now. Okay, so there was a set of lines going indeed from the lower to the upper left, going northwest. They're slightly curved, but generally they're diagonally up towards the upper left. Okay, here they go. They're called dry adiabatic lapse rate curves. Please do not switch off the presentation, leave the presentation now. Okay. Um, just need to know what these curves look like on the chart. If you just as a quick heads up, let's show how right clear air, which is rising, how it cools. We'll just leave it at that. We're not going to use them right now, but they you can use some cool, clear air to calculate or see how much it cools by as it rises. So there's a set of curves doing that. There's another set of curves which look a bit like wavy fronds in the wind. On RASC, these are actually solid lines, <coughs> but on this cutaway, this, this example I stole off the internet here, which anyone could see, <coughs> they're dashed. But if you imagine these are, these are solid lines. These are called saturated adiabatic electrode curves, S-A-L-R curves. <coughs> they're actually the same as the dry adiabatic curves, in other words, they're used to calculate how a bit of air cools as it rises. But these are for what's called saturated air, which to you and me is a cloud. That's all it is. It's a cloud. Now, the reason you've got two different sorts of curve is that, as you can see between the two, they're quite different. And the reason for that is that the condensation of water, when it's in the saturated case, has a pronounced, a profound effect on the way air cools as it rises. <clears throat> Water is one of the most bizarre substances in the universe. We'll talk about that in the next, uh, in the next uh, whatever, next talk. But it, water affects the way air cools as it rises. So, just a minute. So, <clears throat> so this is the slide I showed earlier, just to pick those just to pick those curves up. Sorry. So you've got those dry adiabatic curves rising up diagonally. Uh, somebody asked the question, "What are those lines?" So there's some <coughs> there's some of these calculating lines. The ones, the wavy ones in the fronds, <coughs> waving around that front, excuse me. Get a drink of water here, excuse me. <coughs> the ones waving which are called, which said waving around like fronds, these guys rising a bit more steeply up here. <coughs> They're the saturated adiabatic lines. All you need to do is just recognize which that there's two different lines coming up here. There's this sloping line here, the sloping line there. Forget the dotted ones in the background going up diagonally up to the um, right. Forget those for the moment. <clears throat> so all you need to do is recognize those sets of lines. I'm now just about to show you a slide with a lot of words on it. And apologies for that, but it's a, another very important slide. It's to do with something called stability. Um, so this is not going to be technical. It's about as, te it's about as technical as I'm going to get tonight. Okay. Um, stability. What is stability? Well, we all kind of know what stability is, I think. Um, a stable system is something which is unchanging with time. It's something which resists change. And if it is disturbed, it tries to return to its initial state of position. Okay, that's all fairly high level. What do I really mean by that? Well, think of a pendulum. A pendulum hanging down vertically. It's not swinging, it's just hanging there in front of you. You could watch it for five minutes. Would it move? Nope. You could watch it for five hours. Would it move? Nope. You could watch it for five centuries. Would it move? Nope. If you push it, just keep thinking, you know, push the little weight over a bit, you can feel it resisting that movement. You can feel the weight of it. So it's resisting change. And if you let it go, 
it tries to swing back to its posi initial position. And if you took a photograph at the moment it went vertical, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between it was being stationary or moving. Now it swings from side to side and you think, well, that doesn't sound very stable. But actually, and it's important when we come to waves, stability is important. That oscillation, that swinging actually is, is, a, is a property of a stable system. Think of another one, a guitar string. Pluck a guitar string, it tries to return back to its original position. And uh, you know, that's a stable, that's a stable, that's another example of a stable uh, system. Um, yeah, so things which vibrate are stable. That's why sometimes you vibrate your glider wings to see if they're okay. If the, if, if the, if the vibrations are not right, then you've got a problem with your glider. So vibrating oscillating systems actually stable. Okay. <clears throat> now, so that, that gives you an idea of st stability, hopefully, or what it, what it is or what it isn't. Um, it's important for us because thermals and wave depend on stability or instability. Okay, so in the atmosphere, what does stability mean? I'll show you some pictures in a minute, so just bear with me on these words. Stability means that if a parcel of air, I mean by a parcel is discrete volume of air, is displaced up or down from its initial height, it'll try and get back to where it started from, it'll try and get back to its initial position. Now, you kind of think, why would a lump of air want to do that? Move a pump, lump of air, why doesn't it just stay where it was put? What makes it, come, what makes it want to go back down? Okay, so we've got to consider what this parcel of air is. It's going to be, it's a, it's a volume of air which is free to expand or compress like air can. Um, however, if it's big enough, it's isolated from the surrounding air, if you know what I mean. It's, it doesn't mix with the air, if it's a, like a thermal, it doesn't mix with the air initially. And it doesn't transfer any heat to the surrounding air or doesn't gather any heat to the, from the surrounding air. So it's isolated, insulated from the surrounding air, but is able to contract and expand. Okay, so you've got the idea of a parcel of air. Um, if you raise this parcel of air up, it's going to expand. If it expands, it's going to cool. The cooling is caused by the expansion. It's not because it's moved into air which is cool around it. It's not because of that at all. If it rises and the temperature cools enough that it's actually cooler than the surrounding air, it'll be more dense than the surrounding air and it will sink. So if you've got a parcel of air, if that happens, then it wants to go back down to where it, where it came from. Conversely, if it goes down, it gets compressed. As it gets compressed, it warms up. It isn't getting warm because it's mixed with the air around it. It isn't getting warm because it's received heat from the air around it. It's got warm just because it's compressed in its own little volume. If it's got compressed and it's warmer, it'll be less dense than the air around it. Because it's warmer than the air around it. It'll tend to rise back up. <clears throat> so there's an example of stability in the atmosphere. Um, what that means is that the bottom punchline, if I can point to there, is that the change in the parcel temperature with height, so this is this, must be more than the change in the surrounding air temperature. Right? That is a lot to get into your head. Appreciate that if you're not used to this. So I'm gonna to go to a diagram now and try and explain that. And what I'm, I'm more, not just to explain it, but how, how do we see that on one of these charts? Okay. <clears throat> so we wanna identify where stable air is because it has a great bearing on what we do. So I've got I've ringed an example here of stable a stable layer. Um, I'm going to do some I'm going to do some drawing now, so this is going to be interesting. Okay, so just take it at face value at the moment that uh, this is going to be stable. I'll explain. I'll, we'll do the numbers. I'll do a bit more of the science in part two on Monday, but 
if you see the air temperature line, so this heavy red line, if you see it leaning, I'm just put it out here. If, sorry. If you see it leaning like that, that's very stable air because you can see that the air temperature is increasing with height here. That's very stable air. If you see the air temperature line following one of these straight lines like that, that's still very stable air. If you see the air temperature line going straight vertically, that's still very stable air. If you, I'm going to just draw in here now, just willy nilly. If you see the air temperature line even leaning that way a bit, that's still just about stable air. Okay, if you, and the, the key thing there is that the slope of this line, this red, these red lines, is these lines are more upright than the, both the dry adiabatic line and the saturated adiabatic line. See those, that line rising to the northwest and that sort of frond, that wavy line there. If the air temperature line is more vertical or indeed leaning to the right, then it's stable. Another way of putting it is if you follow the air temperature line up, it's cutting these lines going from left to right. So it's crossed that one going from left to right. It's mm. crossed the dry line there going from left to right. It's crossed these lines going from left to right. So it's, it's coming up the way like this. If you ever see that on a, an air temperature plot, you've got stable air. Is, okay. Is that clear? Let me just, just, I'll just pause for questions there. Do people want me to repeat that? Or is that fairly clear? It's just, I realize it's just pattern recognition. It's just- I mean, the thing that's obvious to me, Phil, is if you look at the bottom there, right? Yeah. I mean, to me, that is definitely unstable air because yeah, it's, it's following- unstable air, you're right. Yeah. I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to get stable stability stored. Yes. That is unstable air, you're absolutely right, Sam. Okay, let's develop that then. So that's unstable air. If you ever see air going like that, the air temperature line doing that, you've got it wrong. The machine's wrong. You can't ever have air doing that, by the way. So, um, yeah, the, 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 you can have a very small amount of that very close to the surface, but you can't have anything like this. So I'll just rub that out. Okay. So Sant pointed out that this line here, which runs parallel to one of these dry adiabatic lines, is slightly unstable. And jumping out well ahead, that's shown a thermal, by the way, this, this plot is this dash red line is a thermal. Okay, but the, the thing I was trying to get here is that what, to, what, a, what a stable layer looks like. And thank you, Sant, that's what an unstable layer looks like you will never get that, a layer like that in the atmosphere that is infinitely unstable. You'd have cataclysmic stuff happening at that point. Yeah, I mean, I hope I'm not screwing things up. I mean, the sort of thing that, you know, to me, coming back to basics, the way what you want is stability between two layers of instability between two layers of instability. And for thermal, what you want is instability in the lower yeah, level. We're just about to come on to that, Sam. Oh, I've sorry. Got the for recipes that. for both. Right. So that was just yeah. set the scene. So you've got the curves, you've got the air temperature, you've got the stability stuff sorted out, hopefully. Here goes. All right. So the next few, the next four slides is going to be two on thermals and two on wave. Um, and it's, as I say, it's at the sort of recipe level. That's probably a good word to call it, actually. Just... So what do we need for a good thermal day? I'm going to, again, just talk through this. Here's the shopping list. Here's the recipe. Six items. 
and then we'll go to the tephigram, which has got these six items on it. So what we want, number one, is that we want the lower air temperature profile follows a dry, the dry, clear air curves from the ground up, a well-mixed layer. I'll explain that later. We've got a stable layer or inversion at a reasonable height. We will see what a stable layer looks like, hopefully. We've got a cloud base present at a reasonable height. I've not actually touched on that, but I will do. We've got dry air above the cloud to minimize what's called spread out, and we'll talk about that. We've got a relatively low wind speed within the thermaline layer, and we've got no thin upper cloud cover. And also, <clears throat> you want that to persist throughout the day. You don't want that just to be there for the morning or late in the afternoon. You want a reasonable run of this. Okay, so let's quickly, uh, well not quickly, let's go into that. What, what does all that look like? So I've ringed all those features. It's the same plot we've just been looking at. So this region down here, the sand has already sort of beat me to it really, is, is what you call a well-mixed layer. Um, well-mixed means it's churned up. It, if you churn stuff up, it all becomes blended up and it's, um, it's a feature or a phenomenon that if you do that, if you blend it all up, then this, this well-mixed layer actually becomes just marginally unstable. And you can see that the, the air temperature curve here follows one of these dry adiabatic lapse rate curve lines. It runs parallel to it. And you can see, as we mentioned in the, just a few minutes ago, there's a small dashed line there and that's the RAS program indicating that there are thermals. So all that has to happen is that the surface temperature just has to go up a little bit and you'll get a thermal. And that's what it's showing there. The surface temperature has got, just gone up a little bit, you're getting a thermal. <clears throat> you can also say it's a well-mixed layer in that the dew point line isn't squiggling all over the place. It's got this little kink down at the bottom, that's because that's where all the moisture is on the planet, down on, on the surface. So there's always a, a bit more moisture down at the bottom. The dew point's always a bit higher there. Um, so you've got this well-mixed layer down here. So that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something like that. You're looking for what something called an inversion. Sorry, I should have gone back and pointed something out that when you get, remember how I drew those air temperature lines, which let me just do it again very quickly. Air temperature line which looks like that, or like that, or like that, or like that. We sure, for shorthand, we call that an inversion or a stable layer. Strictly speaking, an inversion is where the temperature increases in height, but you've got something there which blocks the thermal from climbing any further. That sounds like bad news, but actually, it's a good thing. If it climbs too much, you're just going to get showers. So these stable layers will stop convection, <coughs> over convection. You want it to be high enough. It's no good having an inversion of a thousand feet because that means that's, that's the height your thermals go to. That's not cock, is it? Um, so and as I said, the only time you'll get thermals is if that air temperature line does that. If the air temperature line was doing this, you wouldn't get thermals. Are you clear on that? No thermals. So it has to be, it can only be that. Um, don't want to get out of that. Just a minute. Second, everybody. Arrow. Okay, so we mentioned inversion, cumulus cloud, I'll just touch on that and that what you'd like is a cumulus cloud. Why, do, why would you want cumulus cloud? Well, to mark a thermi, if you don't have a cumulus cloud, it's blue, which is okay. You can fly in the blue, but I think everybody feels better if you fly with a little bit of cumulus cloud. So you'd want a bit of cumulus cloud at the top of the thermal. I'll show you another tephigram with a better view, but if you can just, you're very keen eyed, you can see that a little dotted line starts to take a slightly steeper curve there. I've got another a better example of that further on. But this is the point where RASP doesn't show clouds 
directly. It doesn't got that cloudiness indicator, but there is cloud there. What you want above that cloud is dry air. Dry air means a big gap between the air temperature line and the dew point. Why do you want dry air above? Because this thermal and its cloud is going to go splat against that inversion. It's going to spread out sideways. And if the air above is too moist, that cloud won't disperse. It won't evaporate, it won't go. And you get spread out. You get a lot of it in Scotland. It's quite common in Scotland, particularly late in summer. We get those cumulus clouds start at first and then they spread sideways rather than growing upwards and they don't disperse. And it's called spread out. It stops the sunlight, stops the thermals. So dry air above helps to prevent spread out, minimize the effect of it. Um, further up, you can see that there's no high cloud. Um, in fact, usually on these tepigrams, by the way, I should have said earlier, we generally don't bother. I don't, I don't look at much stuff going on up here unless it's jet stream winds and high cloud. But here you can see there's not much going on up here at all. So that's a good, that's a good thermal day. One of the papers I read, and it was quite good, he suggests, the guy suggests that you're looking for some wine glass shape. So here's the base of the wine glass, here's the stem, comes to a narrow bit, and there's the bit you put the wine in. You look at some wine glass shaped curve here. Okay. And um, so, yeah, any questions on that thermal stuff before I move on to the wave stuff? So it's clear then that what you're looking for is this line here. Anything steeper than that isn't going to cover thermals. Anything less steep than that, there's something gone wrong with the world or with the computer. You've got to have something like that. You'll see thermals with little dashed lines little red ants crawling up the line there. I mean, to me, that looks like a great day. That was Monday. I mean, that's a lovely day. thermal day. I think Zed's online. I can see him, actually. I think, Zed, was that the day you did your 500k? I'd have to look, yeah, possibly. Yep. 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 That was that I've, year anyway. Yeah. Even I managed to struggle around uh, 450k in thermals. And, yep, that's calendar. And, yep, that cloud base is at, at 8,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And the cloud base indeed was 8,000 feet. 8,500 feet, I think I overran it more. So mm -hmm. that was a bloody good day, actually. Um, right. Any other questions? Sorry, any questions? Never mind other ones. Okay. So that's the recipe for thermals. Let's go for recipe for wave. Okay. Uh, shopping list is slightly shorter for wave, but not that much shorter. Um, so, wind speed. We need wind for wave. You need it greater than 10 to 15 knots at the hilltops, which, of course, in Scotland, about three or 4,000 feet, gradually increasing with height. And just as a matter of convenience, you don't want it too windy at cruising levels. Greater than, eight, you know, greater than 50 knots. I mean, I flew a few weeks ago and it was 55 to 57 knots. It was slow going, painful to get places. Um, you want the wind direction to be relatively constant with height and from, for us at Port Moak, this is from the southwest through to north at Port Moak. Um, that, and, and in that direction, it's blown across the wind wave triggers height of each of the mountains, of course. You want an inversion or isothermal layer presence at the height of the hilltops and ridges. Okay, ideally you've got stable and relatively dry air above and below this inversion. If it's too dry, you've got blue wave. Okay, hard look. If it's too moist, you get cloud filled, um, cloud filled skies, I should say, and you possibly get convection. Uh, and can lead to something called unconditional, uh, something which becomes conditionally unstable or is a kickoff convection. So the big of the problem, cloud fills, of course, means the cloud gets below. So one key thing is that you can um, 
you can get a wave in pretty much any direction if the wind's blowing strongly enough to pull back anyway. You can get easterly wave. So let's take a look at one of those. So this is a, a good wave day. First of all, let's take a look at this. I'm going down that shopping list, that recipe list in order. Wind profile, that's, that's one and two. We said the wind speed and wind direction. So the wind speed was oh, pretty good here, isn't it? So here's the little scale, 0, 40, 80, 120 knots. Wow. So at ground level, it's pretty low. But by the time you've got to 4,000 feet, the wind speed is 40 knots. That's getting up there. By the time you're at 10,000 feet, it's probably 50 or more knots. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good wind speed. And you see it's a nice smooth increase. If it cuts back, you can get breaking wave, but we'll talk about that later. You can see the wind direction starts off at the surface at about west-northwest. It changes a little bit to being north-northwest there, but it's a fairly gradual even change in direction. So that's a pretty good wind profile. Um, number three is an inversion. We said we would need an inversion. So here's, here's that inversion. So again, I'll draw those red lines just to rub it in. Just to, so we're looking for a, we're looking for sloping lines that slope like that, or parallel to the temperature lines, or even slightly steeper than temperature lines. Yeah, we've got one there, so that's good. So we've got an inversion. Well, that's great. And I'll tell you what, look where it's at. It's about three, four, four thousand feet. Bang, bingo, right on the Scottish mountains. We've got some dry air above, which is okay. It means there isn't going to be too much cloud around. And above that, you've got a stable layer and you've got a stable layer below it. So what does that mean? It means that if in the wave oscillation, you're not going to kick off convection storms. You're not going to get thunderstorms or showers. You're not going to get too many disruptive thermals. You could get thermals under here if the air temperature increases a bit. You can afford to have thermals underneath the wave, and often you do. Thermal pilots like Zed and John Galloway don't like that because it spoils their fun. Wave pilots like Sant don't like the thermals because it spoils his fun. So generally on those sort of days, nobody's <laughs> going to um, But anyway, um, so um, people have asked me quite a few times, I think Sant just alluded to it there, why does why do you need an inversion on the hills? Why is that important? And I don't know, I don't know if many of you attended a talk by Jerry Marshall last year on Teffy Grounds. Uh, Jerry got his guitar out and uh, sang us a song, which was pretty interesting. Um, he, um, and while he was singing that song, even though it was captivating, I was kind of thinking, you know what, a guitar string is a pretty good analogy for what's going on in wave. We think about a guitar string, it's, remember I said it was a stable system, if you pluck a guitar string that vibrates, it's strongly stable, and that vibration sets the air off around it vibrating, that's why you hear a guitar. So you've got this stable, very highly stable thing vibrating violently, and it's transmitting energy all the way to your ear, transmitting energy through the atmosphere to your ear. Well, if you think about it, just think about this. Your inversion is your guitar string, the plectrum, which you used to pluck it to the Scottish mountains. And that you pluck that inversion with the Scottish mountains and it sets the stuff up above it, and stuff down below, but to a lesser extent, stuff up above it vibrating. In this case, it's gravity waves, which are transverse waves, not, not ideally the same as sound waves, but you get the idea. So <clears throat> if you don't have an inversion down at the mountains and it's up here, the wave will be weak. And in fact, there was a day three weeks ago, Santa and I were flying, I think even Doug, Dougie Wilson was, or somebody was, and the, the inversion was about seven or 8,000 feet. There was a slightly stable layer below it, an inversion at seven or eight thousand feet, and a stable layer above it. And the way wasn't great; it was poor. That's because you need the inversion at the level of the hills. And 
that's what you're looking for, guys. So I've kept it as um, sort of high level as I could. Hopefully that was relatively interesting. That picture you see, by the way, isn't a bit of computer generated images or gra gra uh, you know, graphics. That's an actual wave cloud. And it's probably working, I'd say, isn't it? Yeah. It's one in New Zealand called the, it's actually got a name. <coughs> it's, called, it's called the Tayari Pet. It's down near Dunedin, about 150 kilometers southeast of Christchurch. And that's a pretty significant, uh, impressive wave thing. It's actually formed by interference between waves. There's two wave systems. That's why it's so layered. But, um, anyway, that's, I'm going to stop the talk tonight at that, other than show you some further reading and resources if you need to. Uh, because it's now five past eight, you've probably all lost attention and I'm running out of a bit dry in the throat here. So let's take some questions if there are any sense. Uh, I've just answered some of them. I mean, uh, one from um, uh, one from Alex uh, Stevenson about uh, with the um, with the uh, uh, soundings, with the tapigram sounding, mm -hmm. um, was asking about how far will that ref that forecast reflect what's happening. I mean, given the example of calendar to Port Mo, um, so uh, you know, um, what comments would you make about that, Phil? Sorry, I didn't quite understand that question. What? How? Well, what Alex asked was. Um, how far from the location of the sounding, so the forecast valley, would you expect the same at Port Moat as Calendar? Um, well, there's two ways of answering that. One is that, um, no, I wouldn't expect them to be a calendar forecast to be valid for Port Moat because the mountains will modify the air. So often the, the weather at Calendar can, can be quite different than the weather at Port Moat. So, for example, if there's a lot of rain at Calendar, which there is, um, yeah, by the time the air gets to Port Moak, it will be different. Um, so you can't really extrapolate that. But the, the, the other point is, if you're doing cross-country tasks, you should be looking at the Teffy grams to the places where you're going to, uh, not just Port Moak. Now, RASP has two models, as I've said. One is a UK model, and they've only got a, a couple, I think. It's only Calendar and a Boyne. They show Teffy grams for those two places. But the RASP Scotland side shows Teffy grams for half a dozen, a dozen places in Scotland. Secondly, RASP, if you go onto the site, they've got something called custom soundings. And they're for any one of the 1,300 BGA turn points. So if you know the turn point, and, and Port Moak is a turn point, Port Moak caravan site, <coughs> go into the custom soundings put in Port Moat Caravan site and RASP will turn out a tephigram for you in about 20 seconds. That's a very good answer, Phil. I don't think a lot of people know that. Yeah, they're, they're, they're for anywhere you want. And if you're doing a task, you might as well find the tephigram at the time you expect to be going down that turn point. Uh, I'm, I'm a simple man. I usually just, um, you know, basically, uh, like with calendar, um, the calendar usually shows it far wetter than it is here because it's upwind of us. Um, so um, just because the weather's shit at calendar doesn't mean it is going to be hit. You know, basically, the further downwind you go of a sounding, it's particularly in Scotland, it's usually, as a, a generalisation, it's usually going to be drier. Um, uh, than, than downwind of that tepigram because we're mounting. Yeah. But I think that's also the point where you start to use the other forecasting resources as well. Yeah. So you use the thermal maps, the, you know, the thermal BS maps, you know, all of that other stuff, which gives you better aerial coverage. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, tepigrams, by their definition, are sort of vertical samples. If you need to know about the area, what it's like. There's a point. There's a point gram gives you the guidance to use the maps with a bit of confidence. Uh, there's a point from Kate 
uh, the last hexagram shows you shows stable below and above. Uh, so you're going to have to talk. You're going to have to face. The, I can't hear that at all. You're going to have to face. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, Kate was asking that the last tepigram, um, as far as she understood it, it, it was showing a stable uh, layer uh, below and above uh, for Correct. the rainfall cost. Correct. I always, th I always thought it was an unstable layer. You, you have an unstable layer, then you have a stable layer, and then an unstable layer again, or wave. Um, no, you want you want a, mi a mildly stable layer, then a strongly stable layer, and a mild mildly stable layer. I don't think the very low level layer that you've shown in this diagram Let's have a look. Is, yeah. it's not super critical. That that's very yeah. No, I take the point. Yeah. yeah. Because you, you, well, yeah, you can get, you can get wave if that's stable. It, it can be the case that you get an extra bounce, as it were, if, if, if this is slightly unstable. But I don't think that's a very technical or correct explanation. But you, what you want, as I said, for things to oscillate, they need to be basically stable systems. If they're unstable systems, they don't oscillate. There's another question from John Thomas. Um, is it worth getting investing in SkySight and uh, Top Meteo? Uh, I, I, I have. Um, I think RASP is pretty damn good though, actually. And um, I think you can extract a lot of value out of RASP. Um, is the marginal cost of SkySight better? Uh, does it, is it worth it? I, I mean, I use all three, to be honest. I think Tom Etty is great for cloud, which is important in Scotland. I think uh, RASP is good for wave. And I think SkySight is good for thermal. I think Tom Etty is pretty good for thermal. <clears throat> so would I invest in SkySight? Try it. And that's what we do. I mean, I think we all get a feel for how good these programs are um, by calibrating them against our own experiences. I mean, Santa, I think, Flying in wave, I think the view is that RASP is slightly optimistic for wave and SkySight is slightly pessimistic for the wave. And somewhere in between the two, it's probably okay. I agree with what you say, Phil. Um, I, I particularly like Top Meteo for cloud cover. Uh, I think it's really good. And a perfect example of it was today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's, just see, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah. Ian McIver reckons uh, SkySight is, 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 uh, is, is quite good. Okay. Good. All right, then, look, um, I will be posting this online in the next few days um, so you can read it at your leisure. Um, there are some additional notes to it. Um, if you want to, Sorry, I was going to go through. If you want to look at further resources, further reading, I'll just point out a couple of Keith Blunt papers. <clears throat> this is a very good paper here, the very first one. SkySight's got a link to that page, but if you haven't got SkySight, it's Soaring Society of America Note. Um, it'll be, there's the link. Uh, RASP got a tutorial as well. Do what I've done on several times, just Google gliding tachygrams and you get million and one pages. And these two are pretty good examples. Uh, on YouTube, there's a good source of stuff called Thermobytes. It's done by meteorologists, so it's pretty, some of it's pretty heavy duty, too much for us. But they've done 91 short videos, um, three to 10 minutes, covering several, quite a few bits of this. So if you're really that keen. Finally, if, you get re if you're really sad, you can download some blank tepigram charts and just play with them for all your work as well. So. Anyway, um, that's it for this evening. Um, on Monday evening, thank you, Sam. Um, we'll just kind of work on that, work that a bit in a bit more depth, a bit more detail. But at the end of the day, the outcome's probably pretty much the same. And to be perfectly honest, what I've just shown you today is what I generally use. Um, and it's this, that's all I use tephigrams for to that extent. I don't do these quantitative stuff we're going to go into in the next, uh, next session. 
but it is useful to be able to see what's going on, see why, see how it works, see how the diagram works fully, then you use it to your extent. So you've got the tool, and then it's up to you how you use it, but I'll explain as much as I can um, how to use the tool quantitatively. That's okay. excellent, Phil. Uh, I think right. that's really good. Very good cool. indeed. And by the way, oh yeah, if anybody kind of completely lost, then find me an email and I'll spend time at them in the club, socially distanced at the club, taking them through this or on an email or on a phone call or anything. Good. Thank you, everybody. My pleasure.